be digging into. Uh, the co-authors here uh, are Kevin Hsu, who uh, is an uh, associate professor in the oceanography program at LSU, uh, Ioannis Georgiou, who is uh, in the uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences program at University of New Orleans, Jillian Maloney did a postdoc on this, and now uh, the co-authors here uh, are Kevin Shu, uh, who uh, is uh, was our associate professor in the oceanography of program at LSU. Uh, Ioannis Georgiou, who is uh, in the uh, in Earth and Environmental Sciences program Gulf, which at University of New Orleans, involved in uh, coastal restoration activities. Uh, Jeff Obeltz, PhD student, now uh, working at the Naval Research Laboratory. Jason Chater with the USGS in Woods Hole, who is uh, the director of an ocean mapping group up there. So I have to go into there. So uh, this is where we're located. This is the, the bird's foot delta, and that's what we'll be talking about. And this, this mapping, this area right here is uh, this polygon is the, the extent of the first and only regional survey that was conducted by uh, Jim Coleman and his group in the late 1970s when Jimmy Carter was president. And I think everyone can agree that uh, both the Mississippi River Delta and our ability to map it and measure things on it has changed an awful lot since the late 1970s. So that's what we'll be touching on today. So. Um, most of this is, I want to point out, this is sort of an outline. A lot of this is a work in progress, even though our recent funding has, uh, has ended, where we have other pieces of it that are moving forward. Talk about the motivation and aims. Uh, the one part of our recent study was the synthesis of data from a lot of different sources to sort of figure out what our state of knowledge is. Uh, looking at some pilot studies and looking at some needs and concepts for future work. So the colorful image here is sort of a, uh, uh, is a, bat, is a digital elevation model of the Delta Front region that I just mentioned. The yellow lines are pipelines, oil and gas pipelines, and the dots are oil and gas platforms. So if this area is subject to large-scale submarine landslides and there is a huge amount of oil and gas production there, does that create any, an issue in anybody's mind? Maybe? Okay, yeah, all right, good. You got, you got the point. So, uh, so the area, this has been an active, uh, uh, an active area for uh, both production and transfer of oil and gas since the earliest days of offshore oil and gas production. Uh, it's uh, impacted by submarine landscapes, landslides at a wide range of spatial and temporal scales that we'll talk about. Like I said, the last regional survey was occurred in the uh, late 1970s by, uh, led by Jim Coleman, who's now a senior professor at LSU. And the uh, objectives for the project that we were given by BOEM now about six years ago were to collect uh, the vast numbers of uh, small-scale studies that have been conducted mostly by industry to get an idea of you know, what the knowledge uh, base in the data gaps are. To do, uh, and, and focusing mostly on the collection of high-quality digital geophysical data sets and then conduct some pilot studies with the USGS and NRL to use some newer technologies, both for mapping and measuring seabed characteristics. And then uh, one of the deliverables for the project was actually to write a proposal. And the proposal right now, because our program manager left, uh, boom, the status of the proposal that came out of this is unclear. But we'll move ahead anyway and talk about it. It's a very exciting study. So this. Any, anybody who has ever looked at uh, uh, sort of uh, textbook style descriptions of the uh, Mississippi River subaqueous delta may have seen a diagram that looks kind of like this. This is a block diagram showing the different depositional environments that occur offshore of the outlets of the rift river, such as shown right here. And the main thing I want to broad, uh, draw uh, your attention to is, first of all, the color area is actually is an actual bathymetric surface that we created. Uh, and instead of being a block diagram, this is actually showing real, real stuff. And the, uh, these black lines separate um, undisturbed seafloor from gullies. So these are uh, gullies that form because sediment is flowing downslope off the front of the delta. And these gullies actually flow downslope and they coalesce to form lobes, these big positive release mounds of sediment uh, on the, uh, the lower parts of the subaqueous delta. And these lobes are the ones that really, that can cut loose and create large scale catastrophic uh, submarine landslides. So rapid accumulation rates uh, 
uh, sort of create the, the precondition the seabed for mud flows. Um, waves, the pressuring, pressure gradient from uh, large waves pr passing over the delta serve to liquefy the sediments and uh, activate some of these flows. And also some of these processes are linked to the subaerial delta, which we'll dig into in just a few minutes. And this is from a recent uh, paper that we published in Marine Geology. Um, okay. So, sort of, we know that the Mississippi Delta Front is a region of active sedimentation and active mud, mud flows. And we also know that hurricanes can cause landslides. And I'm going to show you some results for that in just a minute. But at the beginning of our study, we asked ourselves, do land, the, the landslides occur under other conditions? What spatial and temporal scales do they occur and what are the driving forces? So again, the last major survey was a long time ago, so we were asked to do this study. And regionally, I mean, you guys kind of know this. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, there are lots and lots of oil and gas structures. Uh, there are many of them along the Louisiana coast, and there are also quite a few within the area that's impacted by the Delta Front. Now, the sort of poster child for the bad things that can happen due to a submarine landslide uh, is, is this particular case. Um, uh, Hurricane Ivan, 2004. Some of you may have been here uh, when it uh, came roaring through. It created a submarine landslide right off the Mississippi River Delta that was basically a slab of sediment about 30 meters thick that moved a kilometer, a kilometer and a half down slope. There happened to be a production platform with 16 oil wells active in its path. Uh, they were closed off. The safety valves were shut off, but uh, the, the slide was deep enough and energetic enough that it sheared off the pipes below the safety valves. So 16 wells were flowing freely into the Gulf of Mexico, just a few, ten, oh, a few tens of kilometers, so that's exciting. Let's see here. Multitasking. Good. All right. So, uh, uh, so this was owned by an independent oil company called the Taylor, uh, Taylor Energy Corporation. I think that was the name of it. At Taylor Energy. Uh, which is um, a big, well-known Louisiana corporation, uh, Louisiana uh, oil and gas uh, family. They have uh, actually, they started out, they, they endowed the original state uh, college scholarship program in Louisiana and have built millions and millions of dollars worth of buildings on the LSU campus. So, um, this, the company in 2004, over the uh, following few years, uh, invested about $500 million in cleanup. They put $600 million in trust with a trust fund managed by the Coast Guard, and that, liquid, that uh, liquefied their assets. So now the Taylor Energy Corporation went from being a sizable, mid-size mid independent company to having one person who is simply managing lawsuits. So there are hundreds of other platforms and hundreds of kilometers of pipelines in the area that could be uh, uh, impacted. So you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of risk exposure that are mostly small and medium-sized companies that don't have pockets like BP, like Chevron, like Shell. And so this creates a really big unsecured risk exposure for uh, the coastal Gulf of Mexico. So that's why this is an important study. Figure out over what spatial and temporal scales these things uh, happen. So uh, this is actually a seism or, uh, multi beam uh, image of uh, the uh, MC20 platform that we collected in the summer of 2017. Uh, we say we did it kind of unintentionally. It was kind of intentional, but uh, this data set was, uh, was uh, requested by the Taylor Energy uh, remaining employee as a part of their lawsuit uh, through a Freedom of Information Act after we collected it. So this is shallow water, this is deep water. You can see the edge of this, uh, of some of the lobes going off into deeper water. And this is an area where sediment was evacuated and slid down slope and then toppled the platform. This is a seismic image along this line. And uh, so this is the seabed. Uh, this is the platform itself on the seabed. This is an area where gas is blanking out the seismic signal. And this big slab right here is the piece that cut loose and sheared off the platform. It's still leaking. It's still a subject of a Clean Water Act uh, uh, case. And uh, 
some uh, the plaintiff, people who are suing the Taylor Energy Corporation claim that as many as 100 barrels a day are leaking. Taylor Energy Corporation puts it at about 10 gallons a day. So anyway, um, it's a hard question because they have spent a huge amount of money trying to clean this up. And it's entirely possible that any future additional cleanup activities would make the problem worse. But it's still a Clean Water Act infraction, and what do you do? So it's a tricky problem, and there are two very good sides, very defensible sides to this, uh, to this issue. Okay, so what, is, what, what causes a submarine landslide? So uh, this is looking at a sort of a special case uh, of a submarine landslides that are uh, instigated by waves. Um, the uh, forces acting uh, on the seabed include the uh, sort of the pressure gradient uh, this produces a large wave propagates across the shelf, going with the pressure changing on the seabed from sh People. shelf to from trough to crust. Uh, horizontal motions, shear stresses created on the seabed by the waves. Also, you have uh, unidirectional currents that can be active. This would be this thickness right here would be the slab that might be activated, and it has a weight um, uh, that is uh, you know, and the weight is forcing it downslope. But there's also friction at the bottom that is keeping it from sliding. So all these are sort of the force balances that we need to uh, consider when we're looking into whether a slide will or not, will not happen. This is actually the simplest, uh, and it's a fairly accessible model for understanding how some of these slides might be instigated. And this actually is an analytical formulation by a guy named Hinkle in 1970. He derived this after the first major landslides were mapped by Hurricane Camille in 1969 across the same area. So, and you can imagine uh, this line right here might represent the wave surface or alternatively the difference in pressure felt by the seabed as the wave passes a particular location. Well, if you do sort of a moment analysis, what this means is that at this point, uh, there's sort of a, there's actually a, a, an arcuate downslope pressure felt so that so sediment is feeling more pressure here, less pressure here. So it's like you're pushing down on the seabed and pushing it down slope. So this is a, in a way to sort of visualize it one way that wave activity might uh, drive this kind of flow. And uh, although this is an extremely simple version, uh, it's useful. And we'll look at it again in a few minutes. So that we conducted a synthesis of hundreds of studies, uh, research papers, and sort of site hazard studies for all these different platforms. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to show you a sort of a brief synthesis of some of those data. Then we uh, conducted uh, some field work in 2014 and 2017 to use newer technologies uh, to look at what we call hot spots of uh, sediment, sedimentation processes. And we chose the locations in 2014 and 2017 because they were sort of postage stamp size areas where we had high quality earlier data sets so we could actually do time series analysis based solely on the maps that we had collected, like the bath bathymetric maps, for example. Uh, and so we're going to look at some of the uh, data synthesis and the gap analysis and focus on uh, the timing and focus of historical studies and then look at just one piece of uh, how the delta is actually changing based on our sort of synthesis of these, uh, of these uh, data sets. Just to show you some examples of this, these are industry surveys collected by Fugro, uh, and you can see, you know, sort of the brown is shallow water, the blue is deeper water. You can see these gullies that are very clearly shown up on the seabed. This is a lobe of sediment uh, that, uh, that's been sort of extruded down. This is a gradient map showing the slope along the edges of the lobes. And these are, again, you can see other lobes all through here. So these are examples of some of the data sets that we've been working with. I think this is actually kind of interesting. So this, is, this shows uh, a time series of things that have happened to the delta and the types of studies that have been conducted over the time frame in which we've been doing this work. So the first uh, submarine landslide morphology was mapped, was de described by Shepard based on single beam sonar measurements across the area in the 1950s. And then we had Hurricanes Betsy and Camille that occurred at the same time that oil and gas expansion was taking place across this area. So it was obvious at that point that slump submarine landslides were a big ticket item. Then uh, there was a series of, uh, 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 of measurements looking at the rheological properties of the seabed and how these might contribute to, uh, uh, to seabed motion. Uh, the most recent regional bathymetric survey they've already mentioned, 
Uh, Multi-beam technology be started becoming more widely available and advanced in the 1990s. And then, uh, and at this time, we had some initial studies in geotechnical properties, seabed morphology, wave triggering, and the presence of gas and the possible role of gas in driving some of these uh, phenomena. And there's been a more recent, some more recent studies, mostly focusing on shallow seabed sedimentology and geochemistry, like some of the work that I do, for example. Um, but most of the really sort of deep-seated submarine landslide work did take place in the uh, 70s and 80s. And it's quite clear here. This is actually a, a diagram that shows the number of papers by category published each year going back to 1955. Uh, and so this is when Betsy and Camille occurred. So there was a lot of research that took place after people realized that this was a problem. You can't do anything because I'm not uh, there sure. There was a lot of research that took place right after Andrew. And then this began to grow again uh, through the 2000s uh, with uh, the occurrence of, you know, suites of large storms like Katrina and Goose. It says okay, and if I'm so the mouse over report, it says okay. It'll be a pulse of activity, and then it'll die off. There hasn't been a sustained effort to really deal with these problems, and it's been driven by, the, by emergency response, not by a long-term strategic objective to figure this out. So uh, sound familiar with the ONR thing that we were talking about last night? It's the same. We, we've actually, we actually find this pattern in a lot of areas. It shouldn't be surprising to anybody. But it's pretty clearly laid out right here. So what I'm going to do now is show you uh, just a snippet from one of our data synthesis projects that was published this summer, uh, an invited research article in marine geology. So this is the bird's foot delta. Uh, this is, uh, you can see sediment plumes coming out, uh, not only the outlets, the main outlets, but also all the way up here towards Venice. Uh, so there's, this is the plumes coming out, and this is the MODIS image from our EarthScan lab at LSU. So an important perspective is that these, you know, the chicken feet of the bird's foot, the chicken toes of the bird's foot delta have been prograding into the ocean for hundreds and probably out to about a thousand years. Um, this is a pattern that predates uh, large-scale human activities in North America. So uh, there are big anthropogenic impacts on the Mississippi system, but the, this morphology is not one of them. This area that's been prograding based on what we know about bathymetric charts, uh, certainly it's at about 75 meters per year from 64 through 1959. And this is driven by sediment piling up on the seabed at up to about a meter per year. So mid, in the mid-20th century, what happened? Uh, we started putting in large-scale earthen dams, particularly up on the Missouri River. This, the width of this arrow shows, the, the light yellow shows the relative ma mass of sediment coming down the Mississippi River about 1800. And the darker, darker brown, the sort of mustard color, it shows the relative mass of sediment coming down the Mississippi in the late 20th century. So it reduced by at least 50%. Some people would say up to 70% reduction. And uh, did that have any impact on the subaqueous parts of the delta? Up until a few years ago, we didn't know. Most people in this room are probably familiar with delta land loss in the Mississippi River Delta, the disappearance of wetlands and all kinds of the landscape. That's not a new story. It's catastrophic. It's unfolding right now. But we've known about it for a long time. So what I'm going to do is show you the first look at the subaqueous uh, change that we think is a response to this change in sediment supply. And we're going to look at uh, time series results from uh, Southwest Pass, South Pass, and Paso Lutra. So this is... Uh, the green represents the modern land area at the southwest pass of the Mississippi River. The black lines that you're going to see represent the location of the 10-meter isobath during the year in which we give here. So this is created from, a, uh, uh, from an early uh, uh, North American survey, well, it's, it's one of the, the first really good survey of the mouth of the Mississippi River from the 17, 1760s. So we go forward, uh, it's 1838, it's prograding at about 50 meters per year, 1874, 60 meters per year, 1906, out to about 100 meters per year. Then the 20th century, it begins to drop off, drop off, and drop off. Now, this part here from 1764 to 1940 is not a new story. This was actually, these 
types of figures were first made by Fisk and then by Coleman. But the decline in the late 20th and early 21st century is new. No one had really seen this before. What about the other outlets? Well, we see the other outlets, uh, South Pass is actually going into retrograde motion. It's retreating. Didn't know that. Uh, and uh, Pasolutra, uh, off to the east, is also retreating. We didn't know that. So this is the first time that we've actually seen a subaqueous response of the delta morphology changing probably as a result of this change in sediment supply. So it's coupled to the subaerial behavior of the Mississippi Delta. Which I, and now, another interesting thing that I'm not going to show you here is that the deeper portions of the Delta are still prograding. So there's a phase lag in how the system is responding. The shallow water is responding more quickly, uh, but there's still progradation by these mud flows taking place in deeper water. So we haven't caught up to we haven't gone out to a fully degradational phase of the subaqueous portion of the delta yet. But we can imagine that it's coming, and it would be interesting to know when we're going to get there. So this is a summary. Um, now I'm going to show you some data sets uh, that we've collected over the last couple of years. Uh, and depending on time, we may sort of finish this up, and I'll show you a couple of other extra ones at the end. So we're going to focus on hot spots off the passes of the Mississippi River. Uh, the first study uh, was going to be is looking off Southwest Past only. Uh, results published in Geology and Geomarine Letters, 2017. Most of this has not been published yet, uh, and that was the first survey since 20 since the, the 70s, 1970s, when we looked at portions of the seabed off the all, of all of the outlets of the Mississippi River. And this work is very much ongoing right now. Okay, so. Um, Looking at Southwest Pass, this is a figure from, from the Journal of Geology. We're looking at this area right here, where we happen to have uh, a survey from 2005, 2009, and 2014 um, of the same area, using high-quality multi-beam bathymetry. So uh, this, this survey was collected after Hurricane Katrina. So it's worthwhile noting that this period has had no hurricane strikes on the delta at all. In fact, we're still pretty much in a hurricane drought uh, on, the, um, on the delta front itself. So um, the data are actually a little bit hard to, hard to the, the, base, the basic guts of the uh, data set is a diff is difference in depth maps. So taking one surface, subtracting it from another, and then subtracting the next surface from that. So we're looking at the change in elevation from 2005 to 2009 to uh, 2014. And uh, the, because not all of the surveys cover the ex exact identical area, you can't see these patterns in uh, one, one map very clearly. But what I'd like to, what I'll, the, 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 the gist of the story is that the gullies are all appear to be growing deeper upstream. The upstream portions of the gullies growing deeper by about a meter per year. So that's, that, so that's uh, uh, almost 10 meters over the course of the entire survey period. That's well, well outside of the range of uncertainty within. Our, it's, faster, it's a faster change than sedimentation is being delivered. It's also a faster change than would be, uh, could be estimated from error associated with the survey itself. The downstream portions of the gullies are growing shallower. So you can see it's, it's like a, there's a compensational change in depth in these gullies. Uh, they're not getting wider. We Previous surveys have shown that uh, gullies really change both in lateral and depth morphology when big hurricanes come across. So this is just something that's happening under relatively modest physical forcing. So the changes can occur without forcing from large hurricane waves, which had never been seen before. So, so even under quiescent conditions, the delta is oozing down slope. So, uh, Hurricane waves can do uh, can uh, produce a lot of force. So what we wanted to do is think about well, what other kinds of forces could happen. Um, so we we looked back at the, uh, the 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 theory for linear ocean waves. So in other words, waves that are sort of treated as if they're a sinusoidal shape. Uh, and we looked at the theory for that Henkel model. You know the uh, 
the, the uh, wave pressure, pressure gradient figure that I showed you early on. And we ascertained that, uh, that using linear wave theory to sort of predict the lateral pressure gradients, there wasn't enough force being applied to the seabed to drive the motion that we're seeing. So we thought, okay, um, are other uh, descriptions of waves available that might produce a different result? So we tried some others. We, so we tried uh, uh, some nonlinear wave theories that use slightly different morphologies, and we wanted to see if they could generate a different pressure gradient that might have a different result on whether it could drive this motion. So this is a great sort of a just classic photograph of some old uh, you know, survey planes. And these are some examples of nonlinear waves that have steep, short crests and wide troughs. So maybe they do pr produce a different pressure gradient. Who knows? Well, as a matter of fact, they can. So what we did is we looked at the original data set that Hinkel had used to uh, model uh, seabed failure following Hurricane Camille in 1969. And then we looked at typical winter storm waves that cross the delta every year. Uh, the, the solid blue line represents the wave height versus water depth going across the shelf for hurricane waves used by Henkel for his simulations. And also, uh, and this represents the height across shelf of the winter storm waves that we used for our simulations using nonlinear wave theory. Uh, and what we found, and this figure right here shows the pressure gradient difference across the shelf for the small wave using nonlinear wave theory and for the large wave using linear wave theory, and they're almost the same. So this, what this means is that if you use a different way of calculating your pressure gradient with a different wave theory, you come up with a much higher pressure gradient that appears to be fully capable of driving some of the seabed motion. So why is this important? Well, first of all, it's cool and we kind of discovered it. But all of the risk assessments that have been done prior to this story, study, going all the way back to the 1960s, estimate, sheer, estimate seabed failure uh, envelopes based on linear wave theory. So all of earlier risk assessments have, that have been done substantially underestimate the magnitude of the hazard. That's kind of cool and kind of scary, too. All right, so uh, this, this is just sort of a, 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 there are a few physical oceanographers in the crowd who know this stuff better than I do, but this, what this shows is that there, there are different realms of sort of uh, wave height versus water depth uh, in which different types of wave theory apply. And so we, linear wave theory is kind of out in this realm, and uh, then we were looking sort of more over in this realm. So, uh, most, widely, most of the most wave models that are used, like uh, SWAN and the ones for doing sort of large regional ocean wave propagation, uh, do not incorporate this nonlinear type of theory. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is show you some uh, sedimentological results from our study. And this is—I don't want to dig into this too much. There's, I could I could talk all day, like give a whole one semester course on it, uh, but I don't think you guys want that today. Um, what we did is we went out uh, in 2014 and took a set of cores in the same area that we had mapped uh, to look at the distribution of a radioisotope called beryllium-7. Now, without going into the systematics of it, we can use beryllium-7 to essentially fingerprint sediment that's recently derived from the Mississippi River. And what we found is that uh, it, it, was, it was an interesting result, and we've actually come up with recent results that are quite different from this. But uh, the, this, is, this sort of color map shows the mass of sediment that's uh, labeled with beryllium-7 off, uh, off the area, and it doesn't seem to map at all, uh, doesn't seem to be related at all to the presence of gullies or no, no gullies. So the initial deposition uh, of sediment that's occurring out there is initially driven by hydrodynamic processes, and it probably takes longer than a season, or maybe a couple of seasons, to sort of go from being uh, recently deposited to actually beginning to flow into, into these gullies. So there's a, some kind of a lag between the initial deposition, and that's not surprising, but it was, you know, but you could also easily hypothesize that there should be immediate transmission of the sediment into gullies because of hydrodynamic processes, but that's not what we found. So we went out in 2017, 
uh, to uh, do an additional survey with the USGS. We had a week of mapping with the USGS team using multi-beam and seismic tools, and then a week of coring uh, on the point sur using sort of some conventional uh, geological coring tools and also some neat uh, uh, geotechnical tools. So this is the entire area of the Mississippi River Delta Front. It's about 2,000 square kilometers. And these are the areas that we have remapped. So I call it a regional survey. And it is, in fact, the first regional survey, but it doesn't even scratch the surface of the entire area. Uh, so, but it's an, so what we did is we made, it was an attempt to map representative areas of the seabed uh, and core of those same areas. And again, we wanted to touch offshore of all the major outlets uh, for the first time since the 1970s. This, is, this shows the location of the grids uh, that we, we collected and some shallow water data that NOAA has also recently released that gives us, that means that we don't have to, if we wanted to do a complete survey, we don't have to touch these areas. We can focus on some of the deeper water lines. This is the location of the Taylor Energy Platform. I'll show you some results from and just uh, or another image from in a minute. And this is part of the deep wa deeper water survey that, uh, that we did. So what do we do? Most of the analysis for this is ongoing right now, but I'll show you some of the techniques that we used. Uh, we used uh, piston coring. So this is a 10-meter uh, 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 gravity-driven piston coring system. We also had an 8-meter long cone penetrometer system that colleagues in uh, at Bremen University in Germany brought over. And we used a conventional ocean instruments multi-core to shallow this, sample the shallow seabed. Um, and while we were out there, particularly on the mapping exercise, we found something really cool. We rediscovered the location of a World War II wreck of the USS Virginia, or the, the SS Virginia, rather. She was a, um, an oil tank, or a gas tanker that was coming from Galveston to New Orleans, entering into the Mississippi River when she was sunk by a torpedo, torpedo from a U-boat in 1942. 27 people on board died and their bodies are presumably still in the wreck. And uh, why is this interesting? Well, this ship had been located previously by surveys in 2003 and in 2006. And during, between those two times, the location of the wreck moved essentially downhill 370 meters. When we re relocated it, although it hadn't moved a lot, it still moved another 65 meters down slope. And we also were able to ascertain, because of the quality of the imaging, that the wreck itself was essentially stationary on the seabed, but the whole slab of sediment that it's parked on is moving downhill. So, and you can see that here. This, this is the, the edge of the lobe. Uh, this is shallow water. This is deep water. And so this whole mass of material is moving down slope at several meters per year. Uh, much faster uh, during periods when hurricanes are, uh, are, are going. And so this also is kind of new. So the idea, we, you know, we knew that hurricanes were a big deal, but to have such large scale mass transport occurring across kilom square kilometers is pretty, is pretty interesting. And so how is this possible? So, uh, and, and we don't know yet, we don't know yet. And we hope we want to find out, we want to find out more about it. Some more examples of the uh, data. This is off a new survey off of Southwest Pass. And you can see, you know, again, the, this is the reflectivity of the seabed from the multi-beam. And you can see that the uh, gully and the yeah, area in between the gullies uh, have very different reflectivity, which suggests very different sediment types yeah. in those locations. Is I mean, that because of diagenesis, like because, because of the type of physical like properties of fire turbation that are occurring there? We don't really know, but they're obviously very different sediment types. Uh, one of the things that we keep coming back to is, is, is some of this motion made possible because of the presence of biogenic gas. Because if, if you have gas bubbles in the sediment, it makes sense that they could be compressed and dilated and that that would weaken the sediment around them and create a glide plane. This is an image of some of the uh, evidence for gas presence. So this, these are chirp surveys, so these are sub-bottom profiles. Uh, this is a vertical scale. Uh, this, I don't have a vertical scale on here, but this would be on the order of tens of meters. So this would be uh, probably a ten, uh, five to ten meter thick lobe of sediment, um, you know, in terms of this offset right here. And the, you can see in this image 
This is stratified sediment. So this is typical deltaic layering. And then you can't see any layering here. There is layering present, but we can't see it because of gas blanking out the acoustic signal. So this means that, and there's gas here and here and here, so it's widespread across much of the delta. We know that just because of the geoacoustic signature of it. And another thing we know about it is if we sort of turn up the gain way, way high on the CHIRP survey, this gray area, these are actually gas plumes coming out of the seabed. So there are actual bubble emissions taking place while we were doing the survey, bubbling up through the water column. So it's, there's free gas present, and there's a lot of it. So it makes complete sense that this should be an important factor. But the last time anybody tried to look at gas concentrations and figure out where it is, how much of it is, was in about 1983. And they didn't have any tools for measuring, uh, for collecting pressurized cores. We can do that now. It would be really cool to be able to do that. And one of the things we want to do is, is look at that more closely. So biogenic gas in the water column, this is a better view of it. Again, this stratification continues through this area but it's blanked out because of the uh, presence of gas in the sediments. Again, these are the locations of pipelines. These are some of the deep water uh, uh, edges of the lobes. There are actual faults that we can map across here. The CHIRP surveys through here show that there's active faulting taking place there as well. So it's a really dynamic setting. It's quite cool. And then as we go farther into deep water, this is, this is some people would think that this channel is actually created by is uh, initially excavated by the, the Paleo Pearl River when the sea level was lower. And so this would be where the Pearl River comes across the continental shelf and then goes into deeper water. So the subaqueous delta is diminishing in volume due to declining sediment load. Land loss has been recognized for decades, but no one has ever seen a subaqueous change. And this is the first time we've documented that. During periods without major hurricanes, there's a lot of activity that's taking place. You get, you're getting deepening of, um, of the gullies in some places, shoaling of the gullies in others, and these whole slabs of sediment like the Virginia is parked on are moving down slope, slowly, but still moving. Uh, and we would like to expand this to wider regions of the delta in the next few years. My exact aspirations of that are sort of muddied right now because of the of relocation of our program manager to another agency, but we'll see. It may work out. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so it's a huge area, limited data, and there's been a lot of changes in the region since the 1970s. The tools that we have been using don't allow us to actually get deep enough to study the bases of these major landslides. So we really need to be able to drill down through these lobes and collect pressurized cores. We don't really, still don't know exactly when, why, how fast are these sediments uh, move during active sliding. Uh, the, we know now that all the risk assessments that have been done underestimate the magnitude of the hazard. And the gas production has got to be important, but um, you know, we need to be able to look at it in great detail. So these are some of the things that we want to do. I can talk about this in more detail later, you know, after, later on, uh, but our pro proposal right now is kind of fallow. But uh, I want to thank the students who contributed to this over the years, and it's been a really cool place to work. And a good, portion, a good chunk of this uh, has already been published that you, can, you guys can uh, track down. Uh, look, it's available. Most of the published articles are available off my Google Scholar uh, page. So uh, thanks a lot. Talk early. Um, is there any other ways to not to trigger some of these slides? Maybe just continuous wave forcing. Super duper fast. A lot of different directions there.